Amen. Amen. Okay, turn in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 1. I'd like to read verses 20 and 21, and we'll read verse 21 together. Philippians 1 verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And read verse 21, please. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is is gained. As I consider this passage of scripture, I want us to take as our theme tonight that a great reason to live is we live to magnify the master, magnify Jesus Christ. That's why we live. So we're doing a series in Philippians. The overall theme of the series is rejoice. It's your choice. That's what we're saying. Philippians is about, about rejoicing. And now we're looking at three different reasons Paul gives to live. If you're going to live, you might as well live rejoicingly. So to live rejoicingly, we live, we looked at last time, to further the faith. And tonight we live to magnify Jesus Christ. Here we see in the midst of this verse. So now also Christ shall be what? Magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul was not looking to be a celebrity. He was looking to be a telescope. When I think of that word magnify, I think of literally he wanted his body to be like a telescope. Now, I remember when I was a kid, I was a little interested in the stars and I wanted to get a telescope. So, you know, I asked my parents if we could get a telescope. And when my children were small, my children were interested in the stars and they asked me to get a telescope. I think we're interested in the stars, you know. Why? Why are we interested in the stars? Because they're so immense, but they look so small to us. So what does a telescope do? A telescope takes that which is so far away, but it is so powerful. That star, right? That star that's so far away, so powerful, powerful light. And the, the telescope brings it nearer to us, closer, so we can see it better. So we can appreciate its beauty and its grandeur and its power better. And that's what we're to do for Jesus, to magnify Jesus. Because you know what? He's mighty. He's great. He is glorious in his love and grace and mercy and salvation. And yet, for so many that we're walking, we're walking by, he's far away to them. He's in us. <laughs> he's dwelling in us. Paul says in one place that Christ in you is the hope of glory. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives where? In me. Christ is in us. But for so many people, he's not in them. And if he's not in them, it's as if he's far away. So what are we to be? Telescopes. Human telescopes. Not to bring the stars near, but to show people Jesus. To bring Jesus near. This is telescope Christianity because Jesus is great. We want him to be magnified. Look at Acts 19. There's a tremendous example of this. You know, our world, our world is able to take that, which is nothing, like nothing, just insignificant piece of dust and magnify to make it seem great. And we get interested in those nothings. It could be a game. Sometimes I get interested in those nothings. But a game, a game that was played six months ago, it's nothing now. Who cares? But maybe the day before that game, I was like, oh, I, have, I can't miss it, you know? So this world has a way of making things great that really are great. And there's a thousand things like that. Well, that's what was going on in, in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19. Who did they say is great in verse 34 of Acts 19? Who did they say is great? They were saying, Great is Diana! Great is Diana! And how long did they cry that out for? Two hours. They didn't have television back then, but television has a way of making something that isn't great. 
whether it's a news item or whether it's a TV show or whether it's a game or whether it's an event or whether it's Dance for the Stars or Sing to the Stars or whatever show mm -hmm. that people get all excited about and they, oh, you can't miss that show, you know? And I'm like, great is Diana, great is Diana. Now, where's Diana today? They were in Ephesus where there was one of the, they said at the time it was one of the wonders of the world, the temple to Diana, Artemis. And you know what they had said? Do you know why they so, thought she was so great? They believed that the goddess Diana, the actual idol of Diana, where did it come from? Look at verse 35, right at the end of verse 35. Where did, where did that idol come from? Where did they say it came from? It came from Jupiter, and how did it get to Earth? <laughs> it fell from Jupiter and landed on the Earth. Great is Diana! Oh, wow, she fell from Jupiter, and here she's here, you know, for three hours. Now, is Diana great? No. But Jesus is. And Paul was in Ephesus because they had magnified something that was not great, and everyone there, and they even said here that, Ephesus and even the whole world worshiped Diana. And Paul came in there as a great threat to what they thought was great and a great th threat to their economy and to their money and to their idol making business. And they were angry at Paul and they were trying to shout him down. Your God isn't great. Our God is great. Our and so the world tries to shout us down. But the word in verse 17 is the word in our text where it says that Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And then it's here, it says, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all in the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So that's what we want. We want to live to magnify the master. Okay, so we're doing a series in, in, in the book of Philippians. So go back to Philippians. I just wanna ask you a, a few questions. These are just general questions about the book of Philippians. What region of, of Greece was Philippi in? Remember when Paul received that vision? It was in what region of Greece? The northern east. The, does anybody know? Macedonia. I'll give you a hint. Macedonia. Macedonia. That's right. Remember the man of Macedonia had said, come over into Macedonia and help us. And Paul went into Macedonia. And what was the key chief city of Macedonia? Philippi. So... Now, so where did the name of Macedonia come from and Philippi? Where did these names come from? They came from, you remember, we know Alexander the Great, right? When he conquered the world. Well, guess what his father's name? Philip of Macedon. So Philippi is named after Alexander the Great's father, who was Philip of Macedon. Philippi was in Macedonia. And so just like then, you know, we name bridges after former mayors and governors and streets and roads after all that. So they named cities after people as well then. So politically, Philippi was a Roman city. It was like a Rome in miniature. So it was a relatively wealthy city. And do you guys have a map? Do you have a map in the back of your Bible? No, nobody has maps? <laughs> You don't have a map in the back of your Bible? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Well, if you, if you have a map in the back of your Bible, just turn to your maps. Actually, it's always interesting to look at maps. So, Philippi is in Greece, northern Greece. And if you look at Philippi, in this northern area of Greece, at least in my map, there is a pink road that runs all the way through northern Greece, through Macedonia, and all the way then through Thessalonica, and then through Philippi. Does anybody have a map that tells you the name of the road? Anybody? Anybody looking at it? See? It's called the Route 80 of its day. It was like the Interstate 95, you know? Just like Route 80 starts in, as soon as you go across the George Washington Bridge, Route 80 starts. And guess where it ends? California. California. Mm -hmm. That's right. You could take Route 80 from the George Washington Bridge and never get off of Route 80 and go all the way to California. So this was, Philippi was on 
a major interstate of its day so that many people traveling from north to south or i'm sorry from east to west from from rome in the west to asia in the east would would travel through philippi so it was a it was an important city it was a chief city and that's one reason i believe why god led paul there it was politically a, a strategic city a rome in miniature capital uh, it was modeled after the great capital city it had the ignatian way running through it and militarily, it was an important city because you see that is it's in northern Greece, and so basically Philippi acted as a protector city for the rest of of Greece. So it was an important city to keep its borders and strong. The borders are important for a nation, and to keep the people of 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 Greece safe. So it was an important city. Now, Athens was what kind of city? What kind of city would you say Athens was? Athens was a what? A city with a lot of human philosophies. Remember all the philosophers in Athens? They would go out to the marketplace and they loved to talk about new things and new philosophies. And there were the Stoics and the Epicureans and all these different philosophers. And they just loved to talk about new things, new, new ideas and new philosophies and, and ways to look at life, you know. So Athens was a city of philosophy. What kind of city was Corinth? Paul even said, to, he said, such were some of you. You were before what? You were adulterers. You were drunkards. You were... You were effeminate. You were fornicators. You were, but but you're not anymore. You are washed. You are cleansed. You are sanctified in the name of Jesus Christ. So so Corinth was a licentious city of fornicators and that kind of immoral people. But Philippi wasn't a city of philosophy, nor was it a city of licentious carnality. Philippi was. A serious minded city in that sense and it was a a city where there was medicine people would come to study and some some of the best medical uh, one of the best medical hospitals of its day was in Philippi and guess who met Paul in Philippi if you go back to Acts 16 guess who met met up with Paul when Paul was called to go to Macedonia in Acts chapter 16 actually he didn't meet up with Paul he went into Philippi with Paul and from that point stayed with Paul if you go to Acts chapter 16 and notice like in verse 8 where it says and they passing by Mycenae came down to Troas so and then now notice the next verse. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help who? Us. Now, if you say that plural pronoun, us, what if you use that word us, who do you include? Yourself. Help us. Now notice the next verse. He says, Therefore, loosing from Troas, what's the next word? We. So if you say we, we always include so who? It's a group of people. You're saying we, but it includes who? You, if you use the word we. You're, you're included. So in other words, who wrote this book of Acts? Luke. So at this point, guess who joins up with Paul? Because he's saying we. Because before this, I read verse 8, and you can read all before that. It's never we. It's always they, they. In other words, Luke wasn't there. But now Luke says, help us. And then he says, we went there. And then we, and from there on, it's we, we, we. They went, they went to, that sounds funny. <laughs> they went to Philippi. The point is, that, and I, I'm, not, I'm not certain about this, but some people actually say because of this, that maybe this man of Macedonia that somehow appeared to Paul in this vision was Luke, the doctor. But Luke was from the city of Philippi, and he was a doctor, and guess where he studied medicine? In the city of Philippi. So it was the hometown of Luke. Now, so this is just a few general things about the 
the Philippian ministry, city, church. The last thing I'll say about the city of Philippi is here's Paul writing to the, here's Paul writing to the church of, of Philippi. How old do you think the church was when he writes to them this book? How old do you think the church was? Okay. About 100 years or less. Uh, okay, that's a good guess. I appreciate the guess. That's a, I appreciate the guess. Okay, well, look, okay, look at it this way. Paul met him on his second missionary journey, which was about A.D. 52. And now he's in prison in Rome in A.D. 62. Okay, so how old is the church? It's 10 years old. How old is our church? Over 20 years old. We're more than double the age of the church of Philippi when Paul writes to them. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so he's writing to a fairly new church. I don't feel like our church is an old church. I've been here the whole time. Time goes fast, but still. Okay, so the church is about 10 years old. And so now Paul is writing them, if you want to live a joy-filled life, live to magnify Jesus Christ. So very quickly, we're going to finish this in just a few moments as we pray tonight. We live to magnify the Master, and there's four things. Number one, we must have a clear vision of Jesus Christ. A clear vision of Jesus Christ. Look what he says in verse 20. According to my, what's the next two words? Earnest expectation. Those are big words. But basically, in the original language, it's one long word with three words all smashed together. Now, in Greek, they, could, they made these compound words. In other words, they would have one long word, and they would smash. Paul would make up words sometimes. He would smash different words together. And basically, the three words that make up this expression, earnest expectation, is away, head, and watch. Away, head, and watch. So what does that mean? Turn your head away and do what? Watch. In other words, turn your head away from what? In, this, in the context here. Turn your head away from what? Everything that will distract you. Turn your head away from distracting things. Turn your head away from what? Dangerous things. Turn your head away from things that will turn you away from who? Jesus Christ. Turn your head away from the things of this world and put them on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. So that's his, we must have a clear vision of Christ. We must turn our head away from the things of this world, dangerous and distracting, to look to Jesus. The second thing is not only a clear vision of Christ, but a confident expectation in Christ, where he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. We have a hope in Jesus. Now, it's not a hope like, oh, I hope so. I hope, oh, I really hope Jesus is coming again. That's not the hope. The hope, in biblically speaking, is we're confident. We're absolutely sure. This is a confident expectation. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, it says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And so hope is an anchor for our soul. And Romans 15, 13 says that the God of, of hope fill you with all joy and peace. So hope is an anchor for the soul that gives us joy and peace. And Paul says in Titus 2.13 that we look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So hope is an anchor for our soul that gives us joy and peace as we look to Jesus to surely come again. A confident expectation. Amen. We're sure he's coming. Do we doubt it? No. So a confident expectation, a clear vision. Number three, we need to have a courageous boldness. He says, in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness. This word boldness is kind of an interesting word. If you, if you look up how this same Greek word is translated, it's translated this way. Freely speak. It's translated openly. In other words, to speak openly. To speak freely. It's translated plainly in our Bible. In other words, to speak in a way that is plain. Nobody can doubt what you're saying. And to speak with, with confidence, to speak confidently. So that's the idea of boldness. We must speak boldly. You know, the Christian life is not a life to just live 
and no one knows it, is it? It's not a life to live that way. We're to have Christ in our heart, and we have a personal relationship with him, and we do walk with him personally in a private sense, but yet we live openly, and we need to be able to speak freely for Jesus Christ. That's boldness. Jesus said, I speak openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue. And the disciples were bold for Jesus Christ. I love that one verse where it says that they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they saw that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. We're to speak boldly for Jesus Christ. We might not have the degrees of this world. We might not have gone to the schools where they don't really listen to you so well if you didn't go to those schools, you know, is the idea there. But we can still speak boldly for Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Speak freely, openly, confidently. Christianity is a lifestyle, a lifestyle of integrity and honesty to live in our homes, but in the marketplace, in our hearts, but out on the streets. We're to live purely. We're to live differently in a crooked and perverse nation. Look what he says even in chapter 2. You know, we, we can say, well, this New York is so wicked and people don't care about the gospel. They don't want to hear about the gospel in New York. So I'm not going to tell others. No, don't think that. You never know. We're, just, we're to be witnesses for Jesus. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? To who? Every creature. Could, could you give the gospel to the wrong person? If you give somebody a track and they say, I don't want that, do you think, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have given it. Oh, you're the wrong person. No, no, they're, they're a creature. They need Jesus. Look what he says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 15. He says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom he shine as lights in the world. So he doesn't say shine where every everybody's going to love you, where everybody's going to love what you have to say, where everybody's going to agree with you. We're to shine and live openly and boldly and fearlessly for Christ, even when people, what? Don't agree with us. And, and blessed are you, and men will revile you and persecute you for his name's sake. So courageous boldness. And the last thing is maintain a Christ-centered priority, a life centered in Christ, a life centered in Christ. So a clear vision, a confident expectation, a courageous boldness, a life centered in Christ. So here's, here's the blank. In verse 21, what a great verse. For to me, to live is, okay, just, Make, make Christ a blank for a moment. What do you put in that blank? What, if that was a blank, for to me to live is what? Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. Not to everybody, though, is to live to, is Christ. But is for you to live Christ. Is, it, is for me to live Christ. What could you put if, if If we just make the name of Christ there a blank for a moment, what could you put there? For to me to live is what? What could you put there? What? No, but what could you possibly put there? Almost anything and everything. A million things. For me to live is? Money. Money. For to me to live is? Sports. For to me to live is? NASCAR. For to me to live is? Alcohol. For to me to live is? Four day weekends. Four day weekends, yeah. <laughs> travel. For to me to live is travel. Uh, yeah, for some people, they, for to me to live is sleep, you know. <laughs> for to me to live is the Fun. stock market. Well, for to me, what, did you, what are you going to say? Fun. Fun. Party, yeah. Oh, great adventure. Yeah, I mean, I put, I put in my notes, this is so important to you, I know, but. For to me to live is Nathan's hot dog contest. You know, because like when you ever go down to Nathan's in Coney Island, they have on the wall there how many, how many days, how many minutes 
literally until the next Nathan's hot dog. It's like that's the most important thing to Nathan's hot dog, you know, is when it will be the next time that. What's the guy's name? Joey, Joey Chestnut. Joey, Joey Chestnut. <laughs> Dips those hot dogs in water, which ruins the hot dog. I mean, you don't dip a hot dog in water. You put Gouldin's mustard on a hot dog. Okay. Okay. So, but only when Christ is in that space can you say the next part to die is gain. Because if eating Nathan's hot dogs is your life, or if sports and the stock market and fun and great adventure is your life, to die cannot be advantageous because you cannot do anything of those things when you die. Only if Christ is your life is death gained. You know, that word is an interesting word too. It, it means advantage. Death. When we think of death, I mean, I, I started the service tonight. I said that this, there's a young man with eight children who has been prepared, who has trained, given his life to go to the mission field. And you read this prayer letter and how excited, how thrilled they were to finally get to the field and the anticipation of ministry that they have. Pray for us. He's beckoning. And he's dead. Humanly, we don't see the gain of that. But he's with the Lord. Yes. And to die for Charles Wesco is gain. Yes. Because Christ, from all indication, was his life. And this word is translated in another place. You know the word, you've heard the expression filthy lucre in, the, in our Bibles, in Titus chapter 1. That this word is used to translate the, the word lucre, which is money. Because money to many people is the advantage, the, the gain of life is money. I'm going to get ahead with money. But Paul says we get ahead. We get far ahead when we die, when Christ is our life. So magnify the master so that whether you live or whether you die, you bring him glory. And that we can all say tonight, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's pray.